uh, to move us forward some things that I'm excited about tonight. I'm, I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm, I'm really super excited about the, the season ahead, the, the, next, uh, the next chapters of what God is going to do here. And I, I'm so glad that you're here at this, at this moment to get to step into um, what I believe is going to be the greatest season of uh, effectiveness and ministry at the Connection Church, so I'm very excited about that. And just a few things that are that are coming up I want to let you know about. Um, this weekend, you know, we're starting our Olympic series, right? Anybody excited about the Olympics? I've been saying we caught Olympic fever, but I think that means uh, Zika, right? We don't want to catch the Zika virus, but... Uh, but it's going to be exciting with that. And then, um, then also, you know, uh, our baptisms, I mean, we exist for life change. That's what, that's what we celebrate. That's why we do everything that we do to see God change lives and, and uh, just completely change the trajectory, not only of life here on earth, but change the, the trajectory of eternity as we get to help people cr- step over that line of faith and and, and be, be part of God's forever family. And that's what really drives everything. We celebrate that through baptism. That's why we make such a big deal out of baptism. Uh, so, so we're going to be doing that at the river coming up, not this weekend, but um, I believe it's uh, the following weekend, right? And that following weekend, we're going the 14th. That's right. That's coming up. So the 14th. Um, and then... So, so if you want to be part of that, you know, you want to go forward in baptism, you let us know about that. Also, another thing that we love to do at the Connection Church is very important to us is making a difference in our community. That we want our community to know that uh, they're not here for us, but we're here for them. And we've been placed here in this in this in this spot to to make a difference, to be God's hands and feet to our community. That's why we do back to school weekend. And so on that weekend, uh, there's all kinds of ways that we're, we're serving the community with the clothing drive, the haircuts, music, and all that starting at 9 o'clock on the 13th on that Saturday morning. And you can help with that by bringing uh, new or gently used clothing. Uh, we're, also doing, uh, we're also doing the, the uh, back to school backpacks and, and uh, all those school supplies. That's something we want to be sure that we're a part of. And then on that Sunday, the 14th, the big Sunday, we're also going to be uh, just praying over our, our teachers for our school district and the administrators and, and those that, ho- that homeschool, all of that, and pray over our students. We want to pray over all those people. And, uh, and so it's going to be an exciting time, exciting things coming up. All right. But tonight, you're in for a, a really special uh, time because we've got one of our part of our family, uh, extended family, and uh, and and we, we've got someone who's coming to share about the work that he's doing, and by extension, we're able to to do um, in the Philippines. A new work that's that started there, and I don't want to steal all of his thunder, but he serves with Metro World Child. He he was here uh, last year to talk with us. And, um, and he also happens to be uh, the brother of Lauren, if you know Lauren, right? So, uh, so all, that good, all that good stuff. And I'm going to introduce to you, I'm going to introduce him to you, and then we're going to see kind of a video roll in, so you'll get to see a little bit more about the work that's going on, and then he'll be up here uh, on the stage. So uh, let's give a huge Connection Church welcome to Landry Rose. All right, come on. Woo! Give it up. All right, check this out.
Thank you, guys. Glad to be here. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm glad you're here. You guys made the right choice. A Wednesday service, you could have stayed home, but you decided to come here. So yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, first thing I want to take care of is those kids, as you noticed at the end, they said thank you. Um, so I don't know if you guys know what you're a part of, um, but let me break it down for you. Uh, last time I was here, I shared a little bit about um, just the feeding program that we wanted to start up. So uh, last year, we weren't feeding any kids. It was just an idea, just a concept. And now you guys, because you donated, um, you gave out of the kindness of your heart um, to feed these kids. You guys are a part of feeding over 19,000 kids. So you guys need to give yourselves a hand clap. 19,000. That's just from the Connection Church. Um, and that's what you guys are a part of, you know, that you guys are a part of impacting those kids that live off of a dollar a day, those kids that, you know, only have one meal um, to eat a day. And those kids are also kids that are going to hear the gospel when they get fed. They're going to hear the message of Jesus Christ. So you guys are a part of that. And um, I also want to thank you. These kids have been on my heart. I think about them every day. I pray for them every day. Um, and it's just awesome to, to have people like you guys that, um, that want to be a part of that. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that, um, but I just want to break down a little bit of what I do. Um, like you saw in the videos, I, I do these outreaches with the kids, and we're um, reaching worldwide 160,000 people every single week. And um, yeah, God's just doing amazing things. We had record-breaking numbers this past Christmas time. Um, we've, we had more kids than we've ever had in Sunday school. That's kids that are hearing um, the message, the love of Jesus Christ from all different types of religions, cultures, races. They're hearing the message of Jesus Christ. Um, so that's what I get to be a part of in New York City. And in New York City, there's a lot of crime, a lot of gang violence that goes on. And um, that's why it's so vital, so important that we're there. As you guys know, I mean, you guys turn on the TV, you see it all the time. There's just so much hate going on. And that's why it's so important that we're there and we're doing um, what we're doing in New York. And so that's what I get to be a part of, is reaching those kids every week. And, um, and people always ask me, you know, how can we help out these kids in New York? How can we be a part of that? And uh, you guys are actually a part of that as well. The, the Kids Church actually sponsors a child. Um, we have a child sponsorship program. And his name is Cassidy. And he actually rides my bus every week. Uh, and you guys decided to, to sponsor him and send him letters and just um, tell him that you guys love him and Jesus loves him. And it's so cool. I, I sent him the video you guys made for him. And Cassidy, he gets bullied. He gets picked on. But he knows that he has a group of friends that are his age here at the Connection Church. And they say, Cassidy, we love you. We're praying for you. And um, I just appreciate you guys for doing that. And I uh, wanted to give you the opportunity again. You know, maybe one of you guys want to sponsor a kid. Um, and partner with them and tell these kids that Jesus loves them and, and send them gifts on their birthday. Um, but also where the, the finances go is making sure that these kids have a Sunday school program to go to, that they have a church to go to, to hear that Jesus loves them despite their circumstances. Uh, but I want to uh, share a quick story um, about one of the kids, the families we signed up for sponsorship, just so you get an idea of what some of these kids go through, what some of the families go through. Um, so you can go ahead and put up that picture, and I want to tell you about Christian and Jenna. So this is Christian and Jenna and their mom, and that's their mom's boyfriend. So we signed them up. They actually come to Sunday school every single week, really faithful kids. Um, but when we signed them up, we asked, we said, hey, why is, um, why is Jenna in a wheelchair? We, they, they never found out. And, um, and the mom, she stopped, and she said, well, actually, she got it from her dad. And we said, okay, well, what is that? I mean, did your dad, was he sick with something? Was he also handicapped or what, what's the deal? And she goes, no, he, her dad gave it to her. And so apparently the dad had picked up um, this five-week-old baby and slammed her to the ground and bashed her head in. So now she has permanent brain damage. And dad got arrested, so grew up without a dad. And of course, the kid, the older kid, Christian, he had to witness this. He had to watch this. So, I mean, we can't even begin to imagine what these kids have gone through. That's just one story. There was another girl. She ended up getting stabbed. Her grandma got stabbed and killed. Luckily, she survived. Her name's Heaven. She's nine years old. So these are the type of kids that we're ministering to. These are the type of kids that we sign up 
for sponsorship. And, and those are the ones that need to know, you know, despite your circumstance, despite what your father did to you, there's a heavenly father that loves you regardless. And that's where sponsorship comes into play. You get to be that connection point from the child to Jesus. You get to be Jesus in the flesh of these kids. Um, so I encourage you guys to be a part of that. Sponsor a Jenna. Sponsor a, a Christian, a heaven. Um, we got kids from the Philippines and in New York that, that you can sponsor. Um, but now I want to talk um, a little bit more about the feeding program. <clears throat> kind of introduced it last time, but we're actually able to feed 2,500 kids every single Saturday because of churches like you guys. I went across um, all over Texas um, for about two to three months just telling people, saying, hey, do you guys want to be a part of this? And so now that's a regular thing. We're feeding 2,500 kids, and they're also hearing the gospel. So that's, that's huge, but we don't want to stop there. You know, there's actually 13 million kids that live in poverty in the Philippines. So if you actually break it down, we're just scratching the surface of how many kids um, that are living in poverty, that go to sleep hungry, that eat one meal a day. So if you want to be a part of that, I encourage you. I have a, a table set up in the back. And any sort of donation you want to give, you're going to take one of these cards and uh, fill it out. You can give uh, by credit card, by check, or cash. Um, but the money, all of the money goes directly to the food. So it costs 20 cents per meal. It's just 20 cents to impact a kid's life um, that's going to get a meal. And... Um, Hear the gospel, and, you know, you could also do monthly. You know, $20 a month, just $20 is going to feed 100 kids. That's 100 kids that you can impact on your own right here in Texas. So I encourage you to be a part of that or a one-time donation. Um, it's all going to go to the food. And we also have these uh, cool T-shirts that Aaron was, was wearing up here. Um, and these actually feed 70 kids. And so the whole idea, the concept is, of these Hungry for Hope t-shirts is that we want to provide um, hope to these kids, these kids that are, they're hungry for food, but not just that, they're hungry for a better tomorrow. They're hungry for hope, and we could provide that hope by feeding them, by sharing the gospel with them, and so that's what, what the t-shirts are all about. So those are $20, and again, it feeds uh, 70 kids, so that's where the money goes um, for that. But I could, I could share a lot of stories. Um, I could show a lot of videos, but it's, it's not really going to connect until you hear from somebody who grew up in those circumstances, in the garbage dump. So I want you guys to take a look on the screens. You guys are going to hear a story um, of a girl named Anna who grew up there right in the garbage dumps. Hi, hello. I'm Anna Lisa. I grew up here at Philippines, uh, living in what they call the squatters area. I grew up with a big family. I have nine siblings. I remember one time, my mother just came home selling vegetables, but she doesn't bring any money at all. She doesn't have money to feed us. She only has rice for lunch and one piece of banana. And what she did, she cut it into seven pieces and give it to every one of us. She didn't take care of her. So I was like having those slices of banana with me. Her eyes was full of hunger. She worked with us, with my father. I was so hungry in that time. At the side of Sunday school game, and they bring food. They bring a whole banana for every one of us, for every kid that's in there. I attended Saibu Sunday School because of the food they are giving. And I was so, so amazed with that. But one day, one day, there was this big change. At that moment, I just raised my hand and I praised him with all my heart with all the things that I can give to Him with all the praises because that's, that's the only thing that I can give that's the only thing that I can share to Him and now I am here at Metro World Child 
teaching the Word of God, teaching these children, teaching them how it is so important. How the Word of God is so important, even if it's in the little bit way. So please, give or share a small part of your life for these children. This is a small part, but this is a big thing to them. Thank you. Yeah, I give God a hand clap. So as you can see, so the whole turnaround with this girl who grew up in the, in the slums, in the garbage dumps, it all, there was a, a time that just everything changed and it flipped around. And that was when somebody decided they were going to give. They were going to give her, you know, something as simple as a banana. You know, her mom couldn't even afford to give every kid a banana, but she knew She'd get one at Sunday school, and that's when everything changed. She went to college, graduated, and now she's teaching um, boys and girls at Sunday school who live in the same area about the love of Christ. And she had that encounter when she was given food. And, and that's what this whole feeding program is all about. That's why we want to we not stop at 2,500, but we want to continue. We want to double and multiply so we can see more leaders like Anna come up out of the slums, out of the garbage dumps. So I encourage you guys to come and be a part of that. Um, I have a table set up right back there. Um, or even if you don't have anything to give, uh, just come talk to me. I'd love to meet you guys and really uh, connect with you guys. But I have a, a few more minutes, about 10 more minutes, and I'm going to um, let you guys get out of here. But there's something that God put on my heart to share with you guys, and it kind of started with um, what people kept asking me in Texas. You know, Landry, why would you leave Texas? It's a great state, right? So why would you leave it? Why would you go to New York, live there? Why do you continue to go to the Philippines? You know, are you ever going to go to college? And I begin to think about those things. You know, why did I do that? You know, why did I choose to go down this road, this path, instead of this one? And kind of broke it down in my head. And the fact of the matter is I wanted God's will for my life. I, I made that decision that God's will was better than mine. And so... I just I kind of broke it down into these four roads that, that we've all got to walk down if we want to see God's plan for our life. So we're going to be looking into that, and we're not going to read the scripture just for the, the sake of time, but the first road we look at it can actually be found in Luke chapter 24, verse 13. You guys can uh, encourage you read it when you get home. And on this road, there's two disciples, and at this point, Jesus had already died, and they were probably a bit discouraged. They were probably a bit angry because they thought Jesus was coming to set up an earthly kingdom, and then all of a sudden he was dead, he was gone. But then Jesus shows up, and he walks beside these disciples. But the disciples had no clue who he was, had no clue. They said that they were kept from recognizing him. They even walked with him, had dinner with him, and it wasn't until the bread was broken and then they recognized who he was. And that brings us to our first road. First road we all have to walk down is the road of recognition. We've got to recognize that Christ really is who he says he is. You know, when they broke that bread, they realized that Jesus was, he wasn't just this earthly, setting up this earthly kingdom, but he died for the sins of the world. Everything changed. There was that turning point, but it started with the recognition of who Christ was. And that's the point we've got to get to. We've got to get past, oh, Jesus was this guy in the Bible. He's the guy we sing about in church. No, Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's your Savior, and he'll walk next to you like he did the disciples. And we've got to come to that point. And it's interesting. We ask the kids every week what they learn at a Sunday school. And if they get it right, they get to play a game. So one of my friends, he's about nine years old. His name's Muhammadu. He's actually a Muslim kid. He's nine. And so we asked him, we said, okay, what did you learn last week? And he said, well, I learned that Jesus never changes. And you see, in that moment, it all clicked. He had that moment of recognition that Jesus was who he said he was. And, and that was the, the turning point. And I, I truly believe that his life is never going to be the same because he had that moment of recognition. 
And that's what we all have to have. We've got to realize that Jesus really is our Savior. But then there's a second road. And this one, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. It's in Acts chapter 9. And on this road, there's a man named uh, Saul. And not a great guy, not a nice guy at all. He's out to get Christians killed. He's out to get them persecuted. And he's on his way to get even more in trouble, more Christians locked up. But all of a sudden, this light from heaven comes down and knocks him off of his donkey. It blinds his eyes. And Jesus says, why do you persecute me? And that brings us to our, our second road. It's the road of confrontation. Saul was on that road of conf confrontation, and it says, it says that he said, who are you, Lord? Which leads us to believe he knew who God was, but he was confronted by Jesus. He was knocked off his donkey. And so my question is to you is, what is it going to take for God to get your attention? I hope it's not going to be that he pushes you out of your car. I hope it's not going to be that he blinds your eyes. That would be horrible. But at some point, God is going to confront you with things, and that's when it gets complicated. That's when most people quit, most baby Christians, because God's going to confront you with things that you need to change that you don't necessarily want to change. But once you recognize, then you're going to be confronted. And I can think of a time we were walking in the garbage dumps back in February, and uh, my dad actually went with us and another pastor um, friend of mine, and we met this girl named Robin, and this girl, she lived in the slums, in the garbage dumps, and she was 12 years old, but she was actually in the second grade, and so the reason she was is because she had to work. She had to help feed her family. If she didn't go out and work, um, they wouldn't eat, and plus, they didn't have the money to actually go to school for the uniforms and all the supplies, and so now we're in this situation. Okay, what do we do? There's this confrontation, you know, do, is it just another story, a sad story that I share to you guys? Or do we do something? So there's that confrontation. And my dad, he decided, you know what? We need, I, I got to sponsor this girl. So he, he signed up, sponsored this girl. And he decided, you know, he wanted to go the extra mile and pay for her school supplies, make sure she was put in school, and now she's able to go to school. But he was confronted, and he had to make a decision. And God, he's going to confront you. I hope he's confronting you right now of decisions that you need to make. But then we have our uh, third road. And this road is in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. And this was the Jericho Road. And a lot of you guys know this story as well. There was a man beaten half to death. They stripped him of his clothes, threw him on the ground, left him for dead. And I'm going to give you guys the South Texas translation from here. And so this, on this road, um, he's left for dead, and a preacher walks by, right? Okay, surely a preacher's going to stop. Of course, he doesn't stop. Second man walks by. It was a Christian. Surely the Christian, he's going to stop. He's going to do something about this man that's left for dead. doesn't stop. But then third man stops. It's the Good Samaritan. And he stopped because he was filled with compassion. That's our third road. It's the road of compassion. And he picked him up. He bandaged him up, gave him something to eat, took him into the town, even paid his debts. Right? He did whatever he could to make sure that this man was going to be okay. But it was because he was moved with compassion. And the interesting thing, somebody told me one time, they said, Landry, compassion cannot be taught. You know, I can't teach any of you guys how to have compassion. You've got to experience it yourself. Some of you guys, you need to come with me in February and walk in those garbage dumps. You need to walk in the cemeteries where the kids and the families live. And walk down that road of compassion or meet the kids like heaven that don't have a mom or dad. Or the kids that are around gangs and shootings all the time. You have an opportunity today. We've got a sign-up table. You sign up to go see all of those things. But it's that road of compassion. And once you start down that road, 
compassion can drive you to do crazy things. And I can think of a time that my heart was, was filled with compassion. I actually was walking in the garbage dumps in the Philippines. And all these families, they're living on top of garbage dumps. And one of the pastors began to explain to me, he said, these people, they are so poor that they will sell their kids to make enough money to eat. They will prostitute out their own children to eat. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. They will prostitute their own children, sell their own kids so they can survive. So what does that mean for me and you? Is it another stat, another statistic, or we're going to do something about it? And that's what moved me. That's why now 2,500 kids get fed every Saturday because me, you guys, the Connection Church, churches all over were moved with compassion and wanted to see change. 2,500 kids that can avoid that situation now. But you've got to walk down the road of compassion. But there's a, a fourth road. And this is the last one, and then we're, we're done. Um, and on this road, we can see um, Jesus carrying a cross. It's in, it's in John chapter 19. And he's carrying this cross, and this is the road to Calvary. And this is the hardest road that we're ever going to walk down. And I just started taking baby steps down this road. I'm not even there yet. And once you start down this road, there's no turning back. And for our sake, we'll call it the, the road of obedience. I don't know if you guys remember, hopefully you remember what I talked about last time. We talked about how Jesus was in the garden, what he did in the garden before he was crucified. And now I can't prove this. I don't have any, you know, backup to support this. But I believe that Jesus, he didn't actually die on the cross. I believe he actually died there in the garden. Now, his physical body might not have died in the garden, but it was in the garden. He looked up. He said, Father, your will be done. So in that moment, he decided that that was it. He walked down that road of obedience. He gave his life and made the decision. His physical body might not have been dead, but he already gave up his body, his soul. Right there in that moment, the road of obedience. And, you know, it's going to require stuff of us. It might require you to sell your nice car, your nice BMW. I don't know. Maybe sell your house. Maybe quit your job. I don't know. I know what it cost me. You know, when I went into the Philippines, I knew it was over. I can't go back to normal life. Forget it. But once you walk down that road of obedience, there's no turning back. Is it the, the beginning of the 20th century, they had what they call one-way missionaries. And you don't, don't hear a lot about them anymore, but these missionaries, they would pack all of their things in a body bag. They'd pack it in a coffin because they knew once they bought that ticket, one-way ticket, and they went, that was it. Game over. They started down the road of obedience, and it was done. There was no turning back. And so now we've got to decide. Are we going to fit in with everybody else, go down the same road as everybody else? Or as we as followers of Christ are going to go down the road less traveled? So I, I want you guys to close your eyes and bow your heads and, and just focus and, and not get distracted by your neighbor. But, you know, have an evaluation time. You know, what road is it that, that we're on? Maybe you've got to go down that road of confrontation where you know there's things you need to change. Maybe it's the road of compassion where you're called, you know, I need to sponsor a kid. I need to help out more in my community outreach, in my church. Or maybe you're at that road of obedience and you need to give your whole life away. No turning back. But think about it right now. What road is it that you're on? So God, I thank you for my friends. God, I thank you for my family, everybody that's here. God, and I pray that you'd be with them right now, God, and help them to step out in faith and, and walk down that road of obedience. But not my will, God. Not that everybody would sponsor a child or give money, but God, that your will would be done. I don't know your will for tonight, but you do, God. So we pray that your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. All right. Give it up for Landry. Thank you, brother. I'm, was, you really brought it tonight, I tell you. That was incredible. And I'm really, really proud of him and uh, his heart and what he's doing. Uh, so, wasn't that good? Yes. You know, tonight, tonight as we, as we close, we're, we, we're coming to, to the table. And uh, we like to do this at First Wednesday. Uh, what a great privilege it is for us to, to celebrate communion. And um, we think about Jesus in the garden, setting his mind and his heart on, on the sacrifice that he was to make on the cross. And that's pictured here in the elements, in the cup, and in the bread with his body and his blood that he willingly gave, that he willingly gave up for you and me because of his love for you. And it's been said while he was on the cross, he was thinking about you, he was thinking about me. So tonight it's appropriate that we stop and we think about him. We think about that sacrifice. And, um, and as we do, we do want to have a moment to really uh, ask God to search our hearts to be clean before him. We know that he stands ready to do that. He stands ready to forgive if we'll come to him. This table is going to be open tonight for, for uh, anyone who's part of God's family, who's, who, who's taken the step to give their hearts and their lives to Jesus. The table is open for you. And um, you may want to do this in a group. You may want to, uh, you may need tonight for this to be just a moment between you and God. Maybe your family, however you want to do that. But I'm going to pray for us. Uh, we can stand. Why don't we do that right now? We'll stand and I'll pray. And then as you uh, are with your group or whoever you're with tonight, uh, you feel free to, to go ahead and, and take part in communion. There are tables at the back and up at the front. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Thank you so much for giving your only son for us, God, that we don't deserve it. But God, thank you for the great love of Jesus, the greatest love of all, that he would give his life so that we could have life, so that we could have hope, we could have forgiveness, we could have purpose and meaning in life. And God, we... Uh, we thank you for that tonight. Thank you for the gift of the, the table and this beautiful picture of that sacrifice that we remember, we honor, and we celebrate tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>